Now, uh, say we have a, a three-point beam that's being bent with some applied load there. This has some moment internally in it, and what we want to do is, is find the balance between moment and stress. So we can do that in the same way that we did our torsion balance. We say moment is a force times a distance, it is a force times a distance, which is then the integral over the body, negative C to C of sigma B uh, Z dz, Z dz. And then the question is, what is our what is our stress in the body? So B and Z are both geometric parameters. Uh, I'm going to do this for rectangular cross sections just to make things easy. But this uh, idea generally applies, taking the integral over the body. Um, but we're doing it for simple cases because I don't want the algebra to turn into nonsense. Uh, so for an elastic body, we have, or for for all the bodies, we have this convenient rayo that the strain remains constant throughout the body. So uh, the maximum strain at the extreme points of the beam, where this is C and this is minus C, uh, away from the neutral axis, uh, the strain varies linearly. So regardless of whether we're elastically or plastically deforming, and we have this assumption because we're assuming these are beams and plane strain remains plane in our beams, so this holds for everything. So we can take that relationship and in the elastic regime substitute E equals uh, E, sig sigma equals E epsilon for uniaxial stress, uh, do some algebra and get back that sigma equals M C <coughs> over I relationship that we had provided way back in the beginning. But now we have a, a more formal derivation for it. So then the question is what happens when this beam is plastically deforming? And so if I look at the cross section of the beam now, or the, sorry, the stress in the beam. For this analysis, I'm gonna assume this beam remain, uh, has an elastic, perfectly plastic yield behavior, just for simplicity, because that makes the analysis a lot easier. In torsion, we did a hardening material, and you saw how terrible that got, how, and how quickly it got terrible. So uh, this is now our stress relative to our Z. And I want to figure out at some point uh, when this starts to deform plastically, when my yield stress, uh, when my stress hits my yield stress, after that point happens, I'm going to say there's somewhere body. So if I have some hardening or some, some elastic, perfectly plastic behavior, I have a sigma sigma yield, and then the stress will plateau after that point. So then this looks like some squiggly line this way. Uh, this. So now I have some height zy that I want to figure out where, how, how far away that yielding is from the outer edge of the beam. Yeah. Uh, this, I'm, I'm going to assume we have an elastic, perfectly plastic <coughs> material. But if it was a hardening material or a softening material, then this would be hardening or softening, respectively. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming it's perfectly plastic here to simplify the analysis, but um, we're going to go through the same sort of process as we did for torsion, where we split it up into an elastic and plastic component. Um, where this is stress, strain, strain, stress. Um, and then eventually what's going to happen is in this body, I'm going to get to the point where I'm almost entirely plastically deformed and, it, and the, the entire cross section of the beam is just at some yield stress. But for the analysis, we're going to look at this case here initially. So first, we need to figure out where that yield strain is going to be. So I can figure out that zy by saying my that I'm, I'm going to use that epsilon over z equals epsilon c relationship over c equals epsilon c. Um, uh, 
epsilon C relationship, and I want to figure out where Z yield is. And I'm going to say that Z yield happens when I have epsilon yield here. So that Z yield is my epsilon yield C over epsilon C, which is also equal to sigma yield C over E epsilon C. So I can figure out now the, the height, that distance away where my, where my yields, uh, dis or I can figure out that yield distance similar to how I found the yield radius for the bar in torsion. Um, so now if I, if I want to find out in an in integral how that, uh, or if I want to figure out how that moment relates to my stress after the development of plasticity, I can say my moment is some elastic component and some plastic component, which is then the integral from zero to Z yield of sigma B Z DZ plus that integral from Z Y to C. Um, sorry. So the here I'm going to assume that the the bending is symmetric. So I'm actually going to take uh, technically this would be yes. Technically this would be negative Z Y to Z Y, but I don't want to do that. I'm just going to put this as a 2 and take the bending to be symmetric about the top and bottom side. So here I'm going to throw a 2 out front of both of these. Uh, this now, uh, my sigma, I'm just going to have my yield strength. If I'm assuming an elastic, perfectly plastic material, then I just stay at that sigma yield. I just stay at some yield strength and I plateau. Uh, so then this is sigma yield BZ DZ. And so this stress I can still relate to my strain axially or my strain elastically in the same way that I did before. Um, this one I can then calculate out. Uh, so here now my, my sigma is uh, E epsilon or uh, what do they have before? Z, Z over C, Z over C, E epsilon C. There we go. Um, but now here I just have a yield strength. So here I have an integral of Z squared. Here I just have an integral of Z. So if I were to go through and calculate out these integrals, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of algebra and just show you what the final end result is. Um, but this, I could, I could eventually figure out. Uh, I have B's, I have sigma yields, I have uh, C squareds, and I can move all this around and say this is a B sigma yield C squared one minus. Sigma yield over epsilon over E squared over three epsilon C squared. There we go. So if I were to take these integrals, this is just an integral of Z, this is an integral of Z or Z squared and Z now. I could take those, manipulate them, plug the plug in plug back in the, the value that I had for Z Y, uh, which I'm taking an integral between and eventually I would end up with something like this. So uh, this now is useful because I have my only one unknown parameter uh, is this epsilon c, is that strain at the outer yield surface. So if I knew, I, I, I can figure out that epsilon c, say by, by placing a strain gauge somewhere arbitrarily on my beam um, or uh, like on that outer edge of the beam, or by placing it somewhere in the middle of the beam and using this uh, epsilon e over z equals epsilon c over c relationship. But now uh, my yield strength, my Young's modulus are both material constants, c and b are geometric parameters, so I have now my, my bending moment related to the applied strain in the body.
So this is a convenient equation for how my bending moment relates to my epsilon c, which I could technically back out to relate it to my stress. Um, but experimentally, this is the value you would want. So if, if we had, say for your beam bending lab, if we had a whole bunch of beams that we wanted to plastically deform, we could do the same sort of analysis, but that beam setup takes a lot longer than the torsion setup. So we just do that one elastically. So we can do it over and over. Um, so there's two special cases here that I want to point out. So special cases, special case. And those two special cases are when we start yielding, when this beam starts uh, deforming plastically, and then when the beam is fully plastic. So for those special cases, I'm going to say uh, start of yielding and fully plastic. So for the start of yielding, I know that the epsilon at the outer boundary, uh, epsilon c, is my epsilon yield, or uh, sigma yield over e. So this is the, the strain at the outer edge is the yield strain, is the, the yield strength. And when it's fully plastic, I know that the, the yield in the body, or the, the yield point in the body, is much less than one, so that this uh, this height away from uh, or this distance away from the neutral plane that the yielding has started has reached almost zero, uh, even though it never fully reaches zero. Uh, and so that z y, I can also say uh, epsilon y is much less than epsilon c or uh, sigma y over e is much less than epsilon c. So if I take these two cases now, and I take this moment derivation that I come up with, I can say if my epsilon c is sigma y over e, my moment is b sigma y c squared, 1 minus sigma yield over e squared over 3, sigma yield over e squared. So this just becomes 1 third. So then I have my moment, the, the moment that it's re that's required to start yielding uh, is b uh, two thirds, b sigma y c squared. So for, for a rectangular beam now, is it not? there we go. For a rectangular beam, I can say that my yielding starts when the moment is two thirds the yield strength and then here, the c squared for a rectangle would be h over 2. Um, so I could say this is also uh, 2 thirds b sigma yield h squared over 4. I could also uh, plug in and say my i is uh, 1 twelfth b h cubed and say that this is equal to, in terms of my i now, sigma 2 sigma yield i over h. Just different forms of the same thing. But uh, I have one simple relationship for the amount of moment that I can apply in the body before yielding starts. The other interesting case is here when I'm fully plastic. And so if I have that sig epsilon c is much greater than sigma y over e, I have my moment is b sigma y c squared 1 minus uh, this is sigma y over e squared epsilon c but I'm gonna assume because epsilon c is so much greater that this goes to zero and I just have my moment is b sigma y c squared or in terms of my moment uh, this is 3 uh, sigma y i over h.
and I'm going to call this the the initiation of my, my bending moment, my MI, or the initiation of plasticity MI, and the complete uh, plasticity MO, or M sub naught here. And so now I can figure out the relationship, the, the difference between my bending moments, uh, my MI over M naught. So the additional moment that I can apply uh, is just two thirds or three halves if I look at it the other way, which might make more sense. And not I. There we go. So now for an elastic, perfectly plastic beam, I can say whatever, I can figure out what my applied moment is that I need to start yielding. And then if I apply a moment that's 50% higher than that, I will have fully plastically deformed a beam. So uh, this, this goes back to the question that I had asked yesterday about torsion. What happens if you apply twice the torque? Um, similarly, what happens if you apply twice the moment? And so here you can see that in the elastic regime, if I apply twice the moment, I just get twice the stress. In the plastic regime, I can't even necessarily apply twice the moment because I just start fully plastically deforming my material. Um, there's now uh, when we when we look at a beam in in practice, what will start to happen when you initiate the point of yield, say for for three point bending, you'll get the very the the middle point where the bending moment is highest will start plastically deforming eventually that will form because the moment is higher in the middle will form some sort of a uh, an extended region where this is now plastically deformed if we continue to apply a higher load but this is all yielded yielded and then what will happen at the end is you'll form a plastic hinge or something known as a plastic hinge. So eventually that plastic zone will start to get to the point where this center point beam is fully plastically deformed or fully, fully plastic. And so uh, what actually happens is all of the deformation will start to localize around that point. So if you take a paper clip, for example, I should have brought a paper clip. Um, if you take a paper clip and start to bend it, you'll notice that when it starts to bend, it'll it'll start localizing that bending. So this is this is true for any any metal in bending, but you'll you'll start to form a hinge there where it'll deform more significantly around, and it doesn't kind of continue to deform uniformly after it starts plastically deforming. And this is why, because you start localizing that plasticity you lose your load carrying ability um, and you, you lose your load carrying ability because that uh, your, your stress doesn't increase proportionally. So if you start, say, in a building plastically deforming one of the struts in the building, if you get pa too far past the plastic point, all of the strain will start to localize there and you'll just get it kind of breaking it locally at a certain point. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And is this only for beams that are long enough so that the shear stress um, is negligible compared to bending? Yeah. So if this is assu assuming you have a beam, um, and that I guess this a similar phenomena will happen even if you have a, a shorter beam, but this particular derivation only holds for long, slender Euler Bernoulli beams. Yeah. Okay. So um, and for the integ integral, um, if the yield, uh, if the yield stress not not a constant, are you using that as a function of z or as a function of um, the this str the strain? Uh, it would then be a function of strain, which you could relate back to be some function of z. Okay. So, like for torsion, we we related it back to r in some way, but it was like r to the n okay. instead of just a, an axial R. Um, you would do something similar depending on exactly what relationship <coughs> you had. Thanks. Thanks. And how does this make sense 
Right. So even then, if you if you do have a strain hardening material, you're still losing some of your integrity. So that that load carrying ability drops off from that linear line. So you still can't carry as much load as you would if you were deforming elastically. So it'll still localize. I I don't think there's any material that like strain hardens beyond <laughs> the elastic. Um, Although that would be a very interesting material. Uh, although some some materials do have uh, hyperelastic behavior. So if you were to take like a rubber, for example, normally rubbers will deform kind of like this, and that's because the rubber becomes so high, the mo rubber molecules become so highly aligned that you get an extra hardening like way off. So even though like it may not have. Uh, it, it'll be slightly different. You'll probably still get some localization because you have a softening after that, after an initial elastic point. You can get a, a hardening toward the end of the deformation. So there are hypothetically materials that could. But uh, what happens to it after that? Because it seems like a lot of times you stretch it and it's over that way. Oh. I don't have a paper clip, but I have a rubber band. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a brittle failure, but I think once that instability starts forming, it'll lose integrity really quickly. Maybe it did. So it's not, I wouldn't characterize it as a brittle material, <coughs> but because there's so much like elastic, that hyper elastic deformation, I don't know that. Yeah, you're you're kind of snapping the molecules. Maybe it is sort of brittle. That's a yeah, yeah. So that's that's this that's this stiffening behavior. So this is the the hyperelastic behavior. It's really kind of loose and stretchy, and then really stiff when you pull it out. Um, and then it does snap, but I don't know if that snapping is a brittle failure event. Although now I'm second guessing. Interesting question. Let me think more about it. Cool. Yeah. Other questions, thoughts? If not, then we're going to start getting into beam buckling. Okay. So uh, let's talk about buckling. Okay, if I can even spell it, U C K L I N G. So, uh, buckling is personally one of my uh, favorite topics. I, I generally think it's a very interesting phenomena. So, uh, first, I, I want to talk about what I want to go through a little bit of what buckling is, and then the actual detail in that we'll go through the, the analysis that we'll go through is for Euler beam buckling. Uh, which is also what your lab will be on. So buckling itself is an elastic instability behavior. So elastic, elastic instability that involves a bifurcation or a snapping between two stable states. Bifurcation or snapping between two states. So uh, the simplest example of this that I can think of is um, if you have a pin jointed rod here with a, a spring connecting the two in the middle. So the rod on its own could deform, uh, would, wouldn't have any resistance to deformation if it was a pin joint. So you could just kind of rotate it freely. But if you put something in the middle, then that would force it, keep it from moving around. Let's pull out another one. There we go. So uh, pin jointed rod assembly, this would rotate freely. Just use your imagination here. Then if I stuck a spring between these two, all of a sudden there's some resistance to that deformation. So it doesn't want to get extended. Um, but there is some state somewhere in the middle 
of the deformation when I end up with these things perfectly aligned in the center and I have my spring along there as well uh, where this is a quasi staple state so it can stay there and it doesn't necessarily like being there but it'll it'll keep that position but then if you perturb that a little bit it'll snap into this other stable state downward so that's saying here if I take my pin jointed rods uh, I can stretch them around they don't want to deform here they're they're just stable but you can see it's a very a, not a very happy stable state and then if I pop it down to the other direction then my rubber band gets all screwy um, but then my rubber band goes unstretched again and it's it's in a happy low energy equilibrium state um, and so this this kind of snapping behavior this instability we can look at energetically so if we were to say that this has some deflection w from a midpoint and i'm going to look at my energy versus my deflection and my deflection, which I'm going to call W here. Um, at this point, I'm at a low energy state. So when my spring isn't compressed at all, I'm in a, in a low energy well. Here, I'm at a stable or at an unstable equilibrium, but it's, it's uh, not necessarily going to move. So this would be stable, stable, unstable, stable again so energetically what this looks like is i'm at the top of a hill i'm at the top of a plateau which you may have seen something like this before in some of your classes and then as i continue to deform it eventually it pops back down into that stable energy state again so i have it it wants to live in one of these two energy states and if i were to take it to an unstable state, if I were to energetically push the system somewhere that it doesn't want to be, if I can do it with pens, then it wants to kind of snap back to where it was before. Um, and if I push it too far, it'll snap into a different stable state. So these are two stable states that it can exist in, and by pushing it, I'm bouncing to a new stable state. So this uh, I think the most common engineering example of this is with pop top lids. So, so this this is actually a, a bifurcating system. This is a buckling system where when I push it down, so uh, pop top lids uh, on any of your jars, you pull a vacuum or you have something uh, to make sure your doesn't get broken with a jar. Um, but it can exist down in this pop down state or in this popped up state. And so this popped down state is one of our stable equilibria. This popped up state is another one of our stable equilibria. And by pushing the system slightly, by perturbing it, I'm snapping now between these two energy states. So this is a buckling instability, or this is a bifurcation instability. So what we're going to be looking at for this class is rods. So I'm going to pass stuff around. Um, what we're going to be looking at for this class is beam buckling. So, 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 long slender beam like like a ruler. Um, and when I push this ruler, uh, I go from a state of uniaxial compression to a bent state. So I, I can take this beam and I can bend it, but. I don't actually have to bend it to get it to bend. If I push on the sides, it'll naturally pop into this other bent state. And because, so this is, this is the analysis that we'll go through here. But um, what I'm effectively saying is, um, at some point I have a state of uniaxial compression, compression, and then in another state, I have a bent beam. And by perturbing this system, I'm actually snapping back and forth energetically between these two states. So, so you can, this is, this is a particularly slender beam. So if, if I push it just a little bit, it'll bounce out of that equilibrium uniaxial compression 
Um, but you can see if I, if I try to constrain it, I can push down and then if I release that constraint, it'll pop out into that state. So I can try to force it to stay uniaxially compressed uh, by adding constraints, but depending now on what my boundary condition is, I'll pop into different energy states. Um, so, cool. We got like 15 minutes to talk about stuff. Let's jump to there. So, for beam bending, or for, uh, or for uh, beam buckling, sorry. There's, I'm gonna kind of start at the very end and show you the, the one main result that you need to know for beam buckling. And then I'll go through and try to, I guess in the next few lectures, try to work through conceptual examples and show how we actually get to this end state. So uh, Euler buckling itself as, the, as a theory, uh, this is now we're going to talk about beam buckling which is sometimes referred to as Euler buckling was a theory developed by Leonard Euler, uh, same guy as who as the Euler Bernoulli beam um, developed by Euler in 1757. 1757 to describe the deformation of columns that were kind of snapping between these two states. So, so he and other people, as, as the Industrial Revolution was going on, started to see these sorts of instabilities happening. And they were like, well, what's going on? Let's see if I can start to describe it. So Euler recognized that this was, because he also came up with all the beam theory, recognized that this was a bifurcation, a snapping between compression and, and beam bending. And so uh, in that uh, snapping between beam bending and compression, there's one equation that defines now the critical load that it takes if I have a beam of length L, the P critical that it takes to cause a beam to buckle. And that P critical is pi squared EI over KL squared. So E here is Young's modulus. I is that second moment of area or area moment of inertia. And then K is a, is a constant with, that I'm going to call an effective length factor. Length factor that depends on the boundary condition of the beam. And so for that K, now this, this one equation is the one equation you need to know for all of Euler buckling. This is our one important one. And we'll go through some simple examples uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, to go through how we actually get to it. Um, Friday, we'll have a recitation by the TA for torsion. So he'll go through, I think we'll take the full lecture, and he'll go through all of the analysis for how to uh, get through the torsion data. So for beam buckling here, uh, what we want to figure out now is that K, and that K depends on boundary conditions. There's a few simple ones that are analytically solvable that I'll show. Uh, so the simplest one is pinned, pinned, which means that I have a pin joint here on my beam. So it can rotate freely at both ends of this. Um, and for my pinned pin case, how do I want to do this? I'm going to say, sure. Um, let me draw this slightly differently because it needs to be able to move. There we go. Um, when I compress this down, it takes on a bent shape that looks like this. Uh, there we go. Uh, so for our pinned pin case, this is the simplest case, and that's a k equals 1. So everything is kind of relative to this pinned pinned example. There's a fixed pin. So, so pinned pinned is also 
if I were to take this beam and just kind of hold it here, you get this bent shape out, which there should be a ruler slowly getting passed around that please play with it and try to make things buckle. Um, so there's a fixed pinned case, fixed pinned, which I'm going to draw as a rod that's rooted to the ground so it can't spin there and then another rolly thing here and this deformed state uh, looks something like a question mark because now I have that ground state can't move uh, and it uh, if I were to have one side fixed and one side pinned I end up with something that looks there we go kind of question marky yeah and so that fixed pin case I have my K which I can figure out analytically is square root of 2 over 2 or like 0 0.71707 something um, there's a fixed fixed case where I have both of my ends rooted in the ground and in this case I have a deformed state that looks kind of like that somewhat exaggerated for this my k is going to be one half and so this I have both of these ends fixed and I have some uh, the, the angle can't change at the bottom so I have some rotation there in the middle or something like that uh, and then I have a fixed free case free case which uh, I'm just gonna say I have one end rooted in the ground and then the deformed state looks something like this uh, and I'm gonna draw the second half out here here this K is equal to 2 and this one this fixed free case is a nice illustration of uh, why this is an effective length so here this has some length L um, if we were to take that and mirror it onto the bottom 2L we you can see that this is effect this looks very similar to our our pinned pin case yeah, we can see them both um, this looks very similar to our pin pinned deformation so this is um, something like that so this is like a flagpole buckling. And so you can see it's effectively twice the length, which is why here in our Euler Bernoulli here in our Euler Bernoulli case we have effectively two L. So that's why I'm calling this K an effective length factor. Um, it doesn't it, it it's a little bit harder to, to visualize when you have a fixed pinned and a fixed fixed case. You can kind of see for the fixed fixed you have something like the part that's buckling here in the middle. This is like our pin pin example, so the effective length is is L over two. It's just that middle part that's buckling, ish. Uh, but the fixed free case kind of illustrates it a little bit more clearly. So, um, the next part of this. So, for your beam buckling lab, what you'll be doing is taking beams of different length. So we'll have three aluminum beams or three aluminum rods, uh, different lengths, constant I, constant E, and you'll be seeing how, if, if and how they buckle. So there's another, there's something you'll actually be looking at in the lab, which I can start talking about now, like six minutes. Um, but yeah, first, is there any questions on, on this stuff? Before I keep going. Yeah. So this is used a lot in uh, uh, com well, the compliant mechanisms, right? Yeah. Um, so is is this a bit, does this uh, only work for like long slender beams? And is this right? Okay. Yeah. So so the assumption here is that is is the same assumptions we're using for um, our our beam bending okay. stuff. So we have to have an H over L is greater than or less than point one, greater than point one one way or the other. It has to be long and slender, has to have a high aspect ratio, and, and the same 
equations that, or the same uh, same uh, things that make beam be beams for bending valid make this Euler per Euler Bernoulli buckling or Euler buckling equation valid. Blah. Yeah. Cool. Other questions on things? Okay. Let's see if we can get through this in five minutes. It might be a little bit rushed. So what you'll actually be doing in your uh, beam in your beam buckling lab is trying to figure out whether a beam will preferentially buckle or yield. So here I'm going to call this a transition to buckling. To buckling. And I'm going to say if I have a really short stubby column here that I'm pushing on, uh, eventually I'm going to get some yield in in shear general along that plane. But if I have a long skinny beam, I'm going to have a buckling failure. So this will eventually start to buckle. And so what I want to do is figure out when a beam will preferentially buckle or when it will preferentially yield. And to do that, I'm going to take that Euler-Bernoulli equation, or that, that Euler-Buckling equation, sorry, P critical equals pi squared EI over KL squared. I'm going to relate this to a stress. And so I'm going to say my critical stress required for buckling is my P critical over A, which is pi squared EI over A uh, KL squared. And then for convenience, I'm going to define a new geometric parameter called my slenderness. And this slenderness I'm going to define as s equals the square root of a l squared over i. So here you can see area would be meter squared, l would be, be meter squared, i would be meters to the fourth. So this is a dimensionless parameter. And I can plug it into my critical stress equation. I can plug it into my critical stress equation and say this is pi squared e over k squared s squared. And so now this simplifies my, my critical stress slightly. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's, it's a geometric property. So it's a, it's a way of quantifying how long and skinny something is, or how not long and skinny it is. So it's, it's, it, we get it straight from geometry. So what I want to find out now is when this, when this buckling will happen or when yielding will happen. And so to do that, I'm going to set now my yield stress equal to my critical stress for buckling. I'm, I'm going to say if slenderness is higher than this point, then it will buckle. If it's lower than this point, it'll yield. And so this is pi squared e over k squared s squared. Uh, and I can figure out now my s critical, or s transition, not s critical, s transition uh, for buckling is k over pi square root of e over sigma yield. So now, even though slenderness is a geometric parameter, I can say if my slenderness is higher or lower than this critical transition value, then our beam will preferentially yield or buckle. So what that looks like now, if I plot out slenderness, so this is, this is now my S. This is the stress required to cause failure. I have a sigma yield, so if I have a very low slenderness, I'm just going to have sigma for failure, whatever that failure is. Here, buckling I'm taking to be failure. Um, if my slenderness is very low, I have a, uh, a yield here. And as that slenderness increases, um, there we go. Uh, as that slenderness increases, the critical load required to for, for failure uh, is going to slowly decrease. So this is going to be my buckling limit. 
So if I, if I have a very long and slender beam, kind of like my ruler here, it's going to preferentially buckle no matter what, and I, I really am not, I'm not going to be anywhere close to getting this thing to yield. So I, I'm kind of way out here. Um, but here, if I'm anywhere close to this transition point, I may have a, bu a, be a bar that buck yields or a bar that buckles, depending on how close I am to this point. Uh, this isn't necessarily to say that if it buckles, it won't yield afterward. So you can see now for, for a bent beam, I have a, a large deflection on the outer edge, and I can say that that deflection may cause yielding to happen in the bent state, but it won't yield uh, plastically just due to the compression. It'll buckle before it yields. So for your lab, you'll actually be finding a few materials and seeing hopefully where these lie along this S sigma curve. Cool.